tonight on Y News. The UNTV exclusive Batokabe Slay case witness Emmanuel Judavar confirms receiving 300,000 pesos out of the 2 million peso reward money from the Albay provincial government. The Senate Blue Ribbon Committee recommends the filing of charges against former PNP chief Oscar Albayalde and 13 ninja cops. President Rodrigo Duterte assigns freshly minted Lieutenant Colonel Jovi Espinido to Bacolod City, a place he describes as badly hit by illegal drugs. The National Police Commissioner Napulcom recommends three names as the next PNP chief. And Indian President Ram Nath Kovin now in Manila for his five-day state visit. Good evening. The Senate Blue Ribbon Committee released today its report on the Ninja Cops probe. The committee recommends the filing of charges against 13 policemen and former Philippine National Police Chief General Oscar Albayalde. Nel Maribuhok tells us why. In the 39-page report of the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee on the Ninja Cops probe released today, the committee saw the irregularities in the November 2013 by-bust operation of the 13 Pampanga policemen tagged as Ninja Cops. Based on the report, the by-bust team led by Major Rodney Baloyo failed to properly account the seized contraband. The policemen also took several kilos from what they had actually seized. All of these are clearly violations of the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002, the report says. Those proven liable may be penalized with life imprisonment aside from fines and perpetual disqualification from holding any public office. The committee also saw that Albayalde may have profited from the so-called Agobato scheme. The report also points out that what former PNP Chief Albayalde did when he called up former General Rudy Lacadin and PDEA Chief Aaron Aquino to urge them not to implement the dismissal order on the cops involved is wrong. Nakita nyo talagang it was a comedy of lies and uh, errors. Hindi error sir, sinasadya eh. The draft report recommends the filing of graft and corruption charges against Albayalde. Lahat sila, Albayalde, Baloyo, the other people in the group, Lana Gradian, are guilty, I'm not saying guilty, of malfeasance. Mali ang ginawa nila. The committee leaves it to the Department of Justice to look into the possible charges to be filed against the 13 policemen tagged as Ninja Cops. Other recommendations of the committee include the strengthening of the Internal Affairs Service or EAS that is independent and not under the PNP, amending the Dangerous Drugs Act, suspension or dismissal of rogue policemen and not merely reassignments, shortening the review of administrative cases filed against rogue policemen the creation of a program for mandatory training on values and police officers should take a four-year course not taken with the Philippine National Police Academy or PNPA. The draft committee report will be submitted to Senate Plenary for the deliberation and voting of the lawmakers. Senator Gordon is optimistic the committee report will be supported by his fellow senators. Nel Maribuhok, UN Divisions and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The witness in the slaying of Akobiko party list Rodel Batokabe confirms he has received only 300,000 pesos out of the 2 million peso reward money he was supposed to get from the Albay Provincial Government. He says the Albay Provincial Director has explained to him why. Lea Ilagan has more details in this exclusive report. After Emmanuel Judavar went to UNTV last October 10 and reported about the reward money that was not given to him, he was summoned by Albay Provincial Director Police Colonel Wilson Asweta. Nabanggit ni Colonel Langkawo ng Rio 5 na, Jude, gusto kang makausap ni PD kasi mayroon daw siyang gustong ibigay sa'yo. Ngayon, sabi ko kay Sir Langkawo, no, sige Sir. Last Wednesday, October 16, he went to Albay to talk to Colonel Asweta. Judavar said 
Asweta thanked him for his testimony about the killing of Akobigo Party List Representative Rudel Batukabe and his police escort that led to the arrest of the four suspects in the crime. Asweta also confirmed the Albay provincial government gave a 2 million peso reward money for the witnesses. Judavar said Asweta also explained why he will not receive the total amount of 2 million peso reward money. Nung nagpunta po ako doon, binig, ang unang ibinigay sa akin ni PD, 300,000. Ngayon, kasi ang sabi niya sa akin, 600,000 ang ibibigay niya sa akin. Kasi sabi niya, mas malaki ang mapupunta sa akin kaysa doon sa ibang mga witness. Ang sabi niya, pagbalik ko na sa sunod na hearing, automatic ibibigay niya yung another 300. In a text message of Colonel Asweta to UNTV News, he confirms that he gave 300,000 pesos to Judavar from the 2 million peso reward money from the provincial government. Judavar added he also signed an acknowledgement receipt that he received only half of the total amount he was supposed to receive. Judavar said the 600,000 peso Asweta promised him will be a big help for his family. Okay na po ako doon. Kasi naintindihan ko naman yung paliwanag sa akin ni Bidi. Meanwhile, Judavar confirmed the CIDG is still not communicating with him or with his lawyer about the remaining 25 million peso reward money. Of the 35 million peso reward money, only 6 million pesos has been given to him. Because of this, he is in favor of the investigation or hearing that is said to be conducted by Congress to shed light on the issue. He also wants to unmask the policeman who pocketed the reward money intended for him and for the safety of his family. The CIDG have earlier explained that 35 million peso reward money in the Batokabe Slay case is intact and they are willing to give the breakdown should Congress request for it. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, come Crummy. President Rodrigo Duterte issues another stern warning to the so-called ninja cops. He also reveals the reason behind the transfer of controversial police officer Jovi Espinido to Bacolod City. Rosalie Cos has more details in this report. President Rodrigo Duterte issued a stern warning yet again to ninja cops or policemen involved in the illegal drugs trade, including the recycling of illicit drugs confiscated in police by bus operations. You know, kayong mga ninja, kayong mga hold upper, kayong mga drug poser, akala ninyo kayo lang ang matigas. Because you think that you have a monopoly of evil in this country. Well, I think you are it's a very stupid paradigm because I can be evil like you and more than if I want to be. The chief executive made the statement in front of businessmen during the 45th Business Conference and Expo in Manila last night. President Duterte also revealed why he had ordered the transfer of controversial police officer Lieutenant Colonel Jovi Espinido to Bacolod City. Hindi nila binilang ang Davao. Bacolod is badly hit now. And I place Espinido there. Yung tinatakutan nila na police. Sabi ko, go there and you are free to kill everybody. Ta ko, start killing them. Ako nang dalawa na tayong papriso. The chief executive had sacked former Bacolod City Police Chief Senior Superintendent Francis Ebreo and other police officers in January for being allegedly involved in illegal drug operations. 
Espinido became controversial when Mayor Rolando Espinosa Sr. of Alvera Leyte and Mayor Reynaldo Parohinog of Asamis City, Misamis Occidental were both killed in police anti-drug operations in 2016 and 2017 respectively under his stint as police chief. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue, Manila. The National Police Commissioner, NAPOLCOM, has recommended three high-ranking police officers to be the next Philippine National Police or PNP chief. Among the three is PNP officer in charge, Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa, who took over the PNP following the resignation of Police General Oscar Albayalde. Aside from Gamboa, Police Chief for Operations Police Lieutenant General Camilo Cascolan and Directorial Staff Chief Police Major General Guillermo Eleazar are also among NAPOLCOM's top picks to become the next Chief of the PNP. NAPOLCOM Vice Chairman Rogelio Casorao clarified that the NAPOLCOM's short list is just a recommendation. The decision still rests with President Rodrigo Duterte as he may also choose someone who is not on NAPOLCOM's list. President Rodrigo Duterte admits he sacked Philippine National Oil Company Exploration Corporation or PNPC EC President and CEO Pedro Aquino Jr. The president made the admission when he attended the 45th Philippine Business Conference and Expo in Manila last night. Joe Anano details why. Eared by the idiotic deal, the Philippine National Oil Company Exploration Corporation, or PNOCEC, entered into with Russian oil giant Rosneft Oil Company. President Rodrigo Duterte said he asked its president and chief executive officer Pedro Aquino Jr. to tender his resignation. According to the president, Aquino made a contract with a Russian firm that was not approved by the board of directors. <laughs> Presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo has earlier said Rosneft had to forge a new contract with the Duterte administration since its previous deal with the PNOCEC to develop oil and gas resources in the Philippines had been deemed invalid. The palace official also noted the Russian oil firm had already expressed intent to invest in the Philippines. The chief executive has urged other businessmen to report to him directly and corrupt officials in the government. And I mean to the space. I will even cut a cabinet meeting just to... John Nano, UNTV News and Rescue. Three team, three teams, all in a must-win situation will enter their own hard-court battles on Sunday as the first round of eliminations of the UNTV Cup Season 8 continues. Sunday's triple header will reveal which teams will say goodbye to the league early this season. Bernard Dadis details why. Team SSS Kabalikat face off with BITC Global Traders on Sunday's first game. 
SSS is in a critical situation being winless in its previous two games versus the PITC which has one win and two losses. Each team has five games to play in the first round eliminations and the teams incurred three losses early this season cannot advance to the second round eliminations. Four of the six teams on Group A are in a mass win situation. Ombudsman Drop Busters, Will Health Plus, PITC Global Traders, and SSS Kabalikat. Meanwhile, the DA Food Masters will attempt to snatch the lead on Group A as they play defending champion AOB Cavaliers in the second game. The Food Masters holds a 2 0 win loss record, while the Cavaliers 3 0. And in the main game, the PNP responders must win against Malacanang PSC Kamoo, whose records remain untainted in order to continue their campaign. The Season 5 champion has not won any of its previous two games. Which powerhouse team will prevail? Watch Sunday's triple header live from 2 p.m. at the Pasig City Sports Center with live streaming via UNTVweb.com. Burger Daddies, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Welcome back to Wine News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro the third left off. I'm Alex Baltazar, and here are the headlines. Quick hit town in Davao del Sur now under state of calamity. Almost 2,000 Gaisano Mall workers in General Santos City displaced by fire. New Belibid Prison placed under red alert status as prison officials begin to destroy illegal shanties. Indian President Ram Nath Kovind now in Manila for his five-day state visit. And a new Clark City Sports Hub showcases rich Filipino culture. Good evening. The municipality of Magsaysay in Davao del Sur is placed under a state of calamity following Wednesday's quake. The local government will use part of the calamity fund to provide for the basic needs of earthquake-affected residents. Janice Nyante reports why. The local government of Magsaysay in Davao del Sur province has called for support from the national government. This as the municipality continues to strive to recover following the strong earthquake that hit parts of Mindanao on Wednesday evening. According to Magsaysay Mayor Arthur Davin, as the state of calamity has been declared, they will use the calamity fund to secure food and other basic needs for evacuees. With the declaration, pwede na namin gamitin yung 30% of the 5% calamity fund. Hindi lang ako masyado sure sa figures, it's more than 3 million pesos. Aside from the 70% na pwede rin gamitin sa calamity. He adds, they are now coordinating with other government agencies to assist them in providing the basic needs of affected Magsaysay residents. Priority yung mga displaced families, yung mga 295 household na totally damaged. Yun ang binibigyan natin ng mga pagkain ngayon, no? bigas, mga food packs. Tapos yung mga nasira ng bahay, especially doon sa mga bundok, uh, nag-provide tayo ng mga temporary shelters. Uh, the UH is with us also from the region. Nagbigay. Tomorrow we'll be giving hygiene kits and uh, meds. And uh, ang DP, uh, Region 11 DSW, at ang ating local, nagtulungan kami sa mga food packs para mabigyan natin ng pagkain yung mga naapektuhan na pamilya. Meanwhile, based on the report of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council, more than 600 families were affected by the quake, with more than 3,000 individuals from the Region 11 and 12. The total death toll has reached 5, with 89 reported injured. FIVOX has recorded over 400 aftershocks since Thursday. Janice Inhente, UNTV, News and Rescue, Magsaysay, Davao del Sur. About 2,000 workers are now displaced following the blaze that engulfed Gaisano Mall in General Santos City, Suck Sergeant. They are left clueless as to when they can return to their jobs or if there's even a job to return to now that the G Mall is charred. Hazel Ferzas tells us why. 
Hanzel Falalima is one of the approximately 2,000 employees of the Gaysano Mall in General Santos City, Central Mindanao, displaced by the fire that occurred after Wednesday's strong earthquake. Her worry now is how to survive in the coming days. Where to get money to buy medicine for her sick husband? How can she serve meals for her family? These are now the questions she must find answers to. Importante, ma'am, kaya siyempre ako lang po ba yung nagtatrabaho sa amo ha, karoon niya, doha po dahong anak. While Joe Dayaday, another displaced employee, doesn't know how to start anew. Joe had been working in G-Mall for 13 years. Apektuhan ko na mong trabaho kaya siyempre, damo-damo katao din na nagtatrabaho, maapektuhan ko siya. So ang makuha na mo sa government na matabangan katong mga employee na Sila na mag-endorse dito sa mga kumpanya na makakita og trabaho. Employees of the Gaysano Mall trooped to the City Social Welfare and Development or CSWD office today to avail of Disaster Assistance Family Access Card. The access cards will be used by the CSWD to determine the total number of displaced workers so the agency can identify their needs. To do the assessment of the displaced uh, workers of Gmall Jensan. So, ito ngayon nag-start kami kasi ang uh, initially we gathered from them sa Gmall may almost 2,000 silang mga empleyado. At least kung ma-assess natin at merong mga ibang agencies, whether private or government, willing to uh, employ them, mas malaki ang maitulong natin sa mga naapektuhan. CSWD Jensen Assistant Department Head Arabek Kibatilong added they can also recommend cash assistance to the displaced workers. The CSWD office hours are from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., but Batilong said they are willing to extend their hours of operation to accommodate the displaced Gaysano Mall workers. The Jensen LGU conducted pre-assessment of skills on Gaysano Mall employees at CSWDO compound for the job fair Wednesday next week in Magsaysay Avenue. The job fair will be open to the GMAL employees and other job seekers. They are reminded to bring their company IDs. Meanwhile, authorities estimate the damages of the fire are worth around 2 billion pesos. Hazel Ferzas, UNCV News and Rescue. Davao City authorities sternly warns the public that spreading fake news on social media will not be disregarded. In fact, a poster of false information that caused panic among Davao City residents yesterday is facing a violation. Dante Amento tells us why. The Davao City Police sees a 17-year-old female in connection to a social media post, warning Davao City residents of big waves crashing in Dalio Turil, even telling people in the area to evacuate. The post reached many other netizens as it had been shared thousands of times. The post caused panic among residents of Turil. The Davao City Risk Reduction and Management Office or CDRRMO emphasizes the information shared is fake news. That is a criminal offense. Busa bitaw nga kagahapon na sad nanapo nagpakalat og fake news nga dula day may tabo nga dakong linog pagkalas sa sapol. So ang tabo niya na nagaraton na pod ang taga Turil area. Nagato dito sa Mulig nga gym o ban sa Palyok ban sa Katigan. Tungod lang sa gitawag nga fake news. The poster will face charges for violating Republic Act 10639 or the Free Mobile Disaster Alerts Act. The CDRRMO calls on the public to refrain from spreading false information that could cause panic and confusion among people. This is very detrimental sa mga tao. Now, kung dili na ito ni siya mapunggan, sundo ni sa uban niya mga labi ni mga kabatan ulang karon o basa ginsang mga tao nga irresponsibly, maghimu o mga informasyon nga makahatag ng panik o kiyos sa mga tao. Mano nga, ato nang ina-counter. There is no reliable technology in the world that can confidently predict the exact time, date, and location of large earthquakes. So the best thing to do is to always be prepared. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. It's important for people to be prepared for the occurrence of an earthquake. 
But equally important is the earthquake resilience of buildings and structures. Buildings yet to be built or designed must follow the standards. But what about buildings as old as 100 years? Harleen Delgado gives more information on how Filipino engineers can make a decade-old building earthquake-proof. Let's watch this. Do you remember this video that has gone viral on social media? This shows two condominium buildings weighing as a magnitude 6.1 earthquake struck Luzon in April. According to the Association of Structural Engineers in the Philippines, swaying skyscrapers during an earthquake is normal as they are designed to be earthquake resilient. But what about old buildings in the country? According to Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology or Philvox, Manila is one of the cities in the national capital region that would suffer the most in the aftermath of the so-called The Big One. Just like this building here in Binondo that has been standing for 100 years. According to a structural engineer, this can still be saved and turned into an earthquake resilient building. Engineer Roel Ramirez says there are a lot of techniques to make buildings in the country earthquake resilient or earthquake proof. Just like what they are doing in retrofitting this century old Binondo building. He says viscoelastic dumpers will be installed as the building's supporting columns. Ramirez explains through this miniature dumper how the rubbers between the steels will absorb the earthquake shock instead of directly hitting the posts of the building. This rubber will be used to absorb earthquake energy pagka yung lindol gumalaw ng paganyan. Okay? Now instead na yung column at yung beam ang mag-absorb ng earthquake energy, it is this rubber that will absorb the energy so that we can avoid damage in the column and the beam. He emphasizes that old buildings would immediately collapse during strong earthquakes, such as the magnitude 7.2 Big One, if they were not installed with earthquake-proofing devices. Ramirez believes people should now focus on revisiting buildings and making them earthquake-proof. He argues, however, this is not stated in the National Building Code, which sets building standards in the country. That's why everybody's telling us, come on, if there's an earthquake, takbo ka. Diba? So bakit kailangan ganun? Why, is, why should not we design the building to protect us from hazard? Dapat lang naiintindihan nila that with the new technology, hindi ito mahal. No, kasi minsan natatakot na kagad sa cost, hindi natatakot sa lindol. But after the lindol, nanahihinayang sila sa building ng nasira. No? There were structures in the country including a university, a hospital, and historical buildings that were undergoing earthquake proofing, he says. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The Philippine Institute Volcanology and Seismology or FIVOX applications can help towards earthquake preparedness. Ray Palayo tells us why. In the Philippines, no matter what your distance is from a fault line, you can see it immediately by clicking in the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology or FIVOX Hazard Hunter application. In just 15 seconds, you may instantly know if your area has the hazard of flooding, storm surge, earthquake, or tsunami. Feebox advises the public that the 5 meter buffer zone or a total width of 10 meters from a fault line is a no build zone to avoid being affected by the ground rupture. Meaning, we should not build any structure in the 10 meter wide no build zone to avoid the hazard of ground fissure. But what if there are structures already built on a fault line? Pwede naman pong gamitin um, parking area or low, low use facilities yung mga areas na natatamaan ng fault. Pwede pong gawing orchard or as long as hindi po siya um, critical facility. One example of a structure built on a fault line is the Barangka Elementary School in Marikina City that sits on the West Valley Fault. Its old building in the southern area directly transects the fault line. Ground shaking of intensity 8 may be felt in the area. So, sa ngayon po, ang gamit niya ay bodega. Hanggat hindi pa siya nadidemolish. Other buildings more than 5 meters away from the fault line are still in use. But the school management assures the structural integrity of the building after a quake occurs before they allow it to be used again. 
More than 1,700 students are presently enrolled in the school. So, hindi siya pwedeng pasok pa ng bata uh, unless check na mayroon ng permit. permit. But the high school building near the compound is built within the 5-meter buffer zone. This is aside from the residential areas that sit on the fault line. Fibox says it's the local government's call to decide on what to do with the structures. Fibox adds it's better to follow the National Building Code to be sure of the integrity of a structure. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, Use and Rescue, Marikina City. Hundreds of families in Navora City have been displaced after a fire broke out in a residential area in North Bay Boulevard North early Friday morning. The Bureau of Fire Protection, or BFP, said the blaze erupted at past 2 a.m. and reached fifth alarm in just a few minutes. The fire quickly spread and raised around 200 houses that were mostly made up of light materials. It was declared fire out around 6 a.m. The Navota City Risk Reduction and Management Office said at at least 700 families were affected by the fire. The BFP is still accounting if there are fatalities or missing persons. It also has yet to determine the cause of the fire. The Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, launches a mobile application that will help a consumer identify the quality of a product he wants to buy. The DTI also conducted an inspection on hardware stores in San Mateo Rizal, and they found out something good. Joe Anano tells us why. The Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, regularly receives complaints against fake and defective products sold in the local market. Because of this, the agency has come up with a mobile application to easily identify the quality of products to purchase. With the Import Commodity Clearance, or ICC, verification system mobile app, a consumer can detect if the product he wants to buy is registered with the Bureau of Philippine Standard. To use the app, just take a picture of the ICC sticker on an item to check if the sticker is authentic. The app will read the ICC sticker and reveal the details of the item. But what if the ICC sticker is fake? Uh, Napaka-importante nun kasi pag fake yung stickers, ibig sabihin hindi naman talaga dumaan sa certification process yung product. So, pagka hindi siya dumaan sa, sa certification process, tapos nag present ng fake na stickers so may kalokohang uh, ginawa yung importer so ang, ang unang risk doon, baka substandard yung produkto. The app is available at Google Play Store and it's for free The DTI is in the process of developing a version for iOS users Since the app can be used only on items with ICC stickers the DTI is still looking into how the app can be used on products with PS or product safety markings the DTI Fair Trade and Enforcement Bureau was also busy today. Their personnel inspected several hardware stores in San Mateo Rizal. The good thing is they found out majority of the hardware stores here sell construction materials that pass the safety standards. So para naman sa consumers, kailangan alam nilang hanapin ang manufacturing labels. At least yung minimum requirement natin for them, malaman nila na dapat nakalagay ang pangalan ng manufacturer anong size to anong dimension o yung yung mga technical technical specifications ng produkto dapat nakalagay doon the DTI warns of possible suspension or cancellation of the business permit of hardware stores that sell substandard construction materials Joanano UN TV News and Rescue San Mateo Rizal Authorities remain on red alert inside the new Belibid prison in Mundinlupa City. The armed forces of the Philippines have also sent an augmentation force. Sherwin Gulabong tells us why. Snipers of the Special Weapons and Tactics or SWAT team have been deployed. Even PNP Armored Personnel Carriers or APC are inside the new Belibid prison or NBP. This as authorities remain on red alert inside the Bilibid as the clearing operations in the four quadrants of the maximum security compound continue. The AFP have already sent personnel to assist in controlling some 18,000 maximum compound inmates as well as to protect the demolition team. The Bureau of Corrections believes the threat from the prisoners persists due to the destruction of their havens such as illegal shanties. Sa sa challenges natin diyan ay syempre pinapavacate natin yung mga PDL sa 
mga quadrants nila no bago ang gagawing demolition so hindi naman yan agad-agad na na nai-execute so isa yan sa mga challenges natin then yung na experience nga natin last week na merong blasting baka magkakaroon din ulit ng ganun inmates whose shanties have been dismantled are back to quadrant 1 cells the clearing operations in quadrant 4 are about to end while quadrants 2 and 3 are half cleared Sherwin Kulubong, UNTB News and Rescue, Muntinlupa City. The families and friends of kidnapped slave victim South Korean businessman Ji Ik Ju mourn as they commemorate his third death anniversary at the PNT headquarters in Kamkrame, Quezon City. Relatives and members of Korean community offered flowers during the memorial services held right at the spot where Ji was reportedly killed by the police. It was in October 2016 when the slain businessman was abducted by rogue policemen in his home in Angela City, Pampanga in the guise of a drug raid. In May this year, Angela City Regional Trial Court Branch 56 granted bail to the alleged mastermind of the killing. Ji's loved ones continue to cry for justice. The facilities at the new Clark City Sports Complex is ready for the hosting of the Southeast Asian Games this year that will start on November 30. The sports hub design is inspired by the Filipino culture. Vincent Arboleda has the details. World-class facilities inspired by the Filipino culture. These are what await athletes to represent their own countries to the 30th Southeast Asian or Sea Games at the new Clark City. This is the venue of around 60% or majority of the 530 sports events at the Sea Games. According to Basis Conversion and Development Authority in charge of building the new Clark City, the aquatic center that will host the swimming events is a tribute to the coastal heritage of Filipinos. The roof of the aquatic center, inspired by capi shells used in windows of traditional Filipino houses. The facility's structural framing and grid lines, derived from the weaving pattern of baklad or fishnet used by Filipino fishermen. The aquatic center can seat 2,000. It is certified by the Federación Internacional de Natación or FINA, the governing body of international water sports events like swimming, diving, and synchronized swimming. This is the athletic stadium. Inspired by Philippine geography, it depicts the crater of Mount Pinatubo and the contours of Sierra Madre. The stadium can also be a venue for events like local and foreign concerts and festivals. Surprisingly, among the materials used in building the stadium is organic lahar or mudflow debris. It has a 20,000 seating capacity with a 400 meter standard track and nine-lane world-class track and field running track oval. The athletic stadium is certified by the International Association of Athletics Federation or IAAF. The Philippine team coaches and athletes are proud for such world-class facilities. Yeah. The problem, we have a very nice safe bike course sa labas sa Tarlac. And of course, yung gym, completo rin. High, high class, uh, world class ng mga gym equipment yung nandito sa loob. Before past sea games and Asian games, nagtitrain tayo abroad. We trained in Malaysia, we even go as far as uh, sa Spain para mag-train. Just to have this, ano, ma uh, ma-attain lang yung ganitong facility. Sobrang saya namin kasi may ganitong facility tayo na ginagamit. So, hindi na namin kailangan lumabas papunta sa ibang bansa para mag-training para sa darating na sea games. So, Masaya kami at tinutulungan kami ng gobyerno ngayon. With these Pinoy-inspired and world-class facilities, home ground advantage, and support from fellow Filipinos, Filipino athletes hope they could go full swing to grab gold in this edition of the SEA Games. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, New Clark City, Tarlac. And to complete the most significant news for this day, Y News continues. Here are the top stories. A five-year project has been launched in Paris to provide training and support to beekeepers around the world in the aim of saving the dwindling bee population. Jovic Burmas reports. 
UNESCO and French perfumer Garland have teamed up in a program that will focus on beekeeper training in UNESCO Biosphere Reserves, the creation of bee farms, technical support for beekeepers, and research into pollination in local ecosystems. The first year of the project will be a trial year conducted on a small scale in Ethiopia, Rwanda, Cambodia, and China, followed by four years of worldwide expansion. By 2024, the project plans to create 44 new biosphere reserves in 44 countries, build 4,400 new hives, and train 88 beekeepers. Gothland, who say they hope to be carbon neutral by 2028, have embarked on several sustainable initiatives in recent years, using electric lorries to supply their Paris stores since 2014 and creating a recycling scheme for used perfume bottles. Speaking of the launch in UNESCO's Paris headquarters, Director General Audrey Azoulay said that bees provide extraordinary services for humanity. Without bees, there would be no beauty in the world today. In May 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which groups 130 countries, including the United States, Russia, and China, published a report on the devastating impact of modern civilization on the natural world. Known as the Global Assessment, the report found that up to 1 million of Earth's estimated 8 million plant, insect, and animal species is at risk of extinction, many within decades. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue. And for the news abroad, heroic passengers in Argentina stopped the train from running over a woman after she was accidentally pushed onto the tracks by a man who fainted. Let's watch this report. Surveillance footage taken at Puyredon subway train station in Buenos Aires shows a male passenger leaning against the wall and looking down at the ground. The man who was unidentified suddenly lurches forward and lands on a woman who was walking in front of him near the platform edge. The woman was then shoved onto the D-line track and landed on her back. Worried passengers immediately waved their hands and belongings at the train driver as the subway entered the station. The operator was able to slam on the brakes just a couple of feet from where the woman was lying. Two passengers then jumped onto the track and managed to pull the woman back onto the platform. They waited with her and the man who had inadvertently sent her flying onto the tracks until paramedics arrived. The medical conditions of the passengers who fainted and the woman who fell onto the track are unknown. I'm Yael Pascual, UNTV News and Rescue. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump defended his Middle East policy as he comes under bipartisan criticism over his administration's move to withdraw U.S. troops from northeast Syria and an agreement for a 120-hour pause to a Turkish incursion of the area. Judith Anna Fuente details why. U.S. President Donald Trump said on Thursday that ISIS is totally under control after Turkey agreed to pause its offensive in Syria for five days to let Kurdish forces withdraw from a safe zone. The truce was announced by U.S. Vice President Mike Pence after talks in Ankara with Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan and was praised by President Donald Trump. Uh, but I want to thank President Erdogan of Turkey. I want to thank the Kurds and Kurd leadership. I want to thank certain other countries that behind the scenes were helping us out. And it's a tremendous thing. Uh, ISIS is totally under control and we're continuing to capture more. We have a tremendous situation worked out in so many different ways and uh, it's an honor to have been involved in it. It was also unclear if the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, would fully comply with the agreement, which would leave Turkish forces in charge of a swath of territory that the Kurds once held with U.S. military support. The deal struck with Erdogan also provided for Turkey not to engage in military operations in the flashpoint Syrian border town of Kobani, Pence said. Kavusoglu said Turkey had given no commitments about Kobani. 
The Turkish assault has created a new humanitarian crisis in Syria, with 200,000 civilians taking flight. A security alert over thousands of Islamic State fighters potentially abandoned in Kurdish jails and a political maelstrom at home for Trump. The Turkish assault began on October 9th after Trump moved U.S. troops out of the way after an October 6th phone call with Erdogan. Trump announced sanctions on Turkey on Monday after the assault began, but critics said these were too little, too late. Judith Alnofuente, UNTV News in Rescue. When Japanese Prince Hisahito visited Bhutan in August on his first overseas trip just months after his uncle Emperor Naruhito ascended the ancient chrysanthemum throne, media treated the event as the debut of a future monarch. Now some experts and media are wondering whether Hisahito is being properly groomed for his future role. Kaf Dumaraos explains why. Emperor Naruhito, who became emperor on May 1st after his father Akihito abdicated, will proclaim his enthronement in a ceremony on October 22nd before foreign and domestic dignitaries. Hisahito, 13, is second in line to the throne after his father Crown Prince Akishino, 53, the younger brother of 59-year-old Emperor Naruhito. There are no other royal males in Hisahito's generation. Hisahito's birth in 2006 was seen as a miracle by conservatives eager to preserve the male's only succession. No imperial males had been born since 1965, and after eight years of marriage, Naruhito's wife Masako had given birth to a girl, Princess Aiko, prompting moves to revise the succession law to allow women to inherit and pass on the throne. Plans to change the law were scrapped after Hisahito was born. Under the post-war constitution, Japan's emperor has no political authority and is designated as the symbol of the state and of the unity of the people. It is important to have him realize that he is in a position to inherit the throne when interacting with people and to keep them in mind from an early age. Unlike his grandfather, Emperor Akihito, who carved out an active role as a symbol of peace, democracy, and reconciliation with victims of Japan's World War II aggression, Hisahito has no special mentor to help him prepare for his future kingship. When Parliament passed a special law allowing Akihito to abdicate in 2017, it adopted a non-binding resolution asking the government to consider how to ensure a stable succession. One option is to allow females, including Aiko and Hisahito's two elder sisters, to remain in the imperial family after marriage and inherit or pass on the throne to their children, a change surveys show most ordinary Japanese favor. Retiree Hiromi Kosaka said, In this present time, we do not have to think about gender. We have had a female emperor in the history of Japan, so I think it is natural. Abe, though, is unlikely to want to open controversial discussions. They want to put off debate as much as possible, Kasahara said. Some Japanese people agree. Nurse Fumi Hiraoka thinks Princess Aiko can't bear the opposing opinions on having a female emperor. She said, I think it is better to keep the custom and let the throne be inherited to only males. Kat Dumaraos, TV News and Rescue. When astronauts orbit the moon or live on its surface in the decade ahead, they will probably be doing so inside inflatable space lodges now in development. Ferdi Petalio has the story. Dozens of NASA officials and veteran astronauts are wrapping up a review of five space habitat mock-ups built by different companies. The mock-ups offer the U.S. space agencies ideas for an ideal gateway, the planned research outpost in lunar orbit that will house and transfer astronauts to the surface of the moon. And the whole point is to define what we like and don't like about these different habitats. He and his team were making a final inspection recently in Las Vegas, Nevada at the headquarters of the Bigelow Aerospace, a space habitat company founded by hotel chain billionaire Robert Bigelow. 
U.S. Vice President Mike Pence in March told NASA to land its first crew astronauts on the moon by 2024. That accelerated timeline spawned the space agency's Artemis program, a modular space station in orbit around the moon with living quarters for astronauts, a lab for science and research, and ports for visiting the spacecraft. And so Gateway is an opportunity to test all these structures and in a deep space environment, so to speak, even though it's so close to home, uh, as a prelude to going to Mars. Potentially, we think that for the rest of this century, this, the expandable architectures is where it's at. The B330 habitat launched from Earth compacted inside a rocket. It's made of fabric-like material designed to shield the inhabitants from deep space radiation and high-speed space debris. Once docked alongside other gateway modules in a lunar orbit, the habitat unfurls into two-story, 55-foot-long outposts that up to six astronauts could stay in. The Lunar Space Habitat and Colonization Program is expected to cost over a billion dollars through 2028. Ferdi Petalio, UNTV News and Rescue. President Rodrigo Duterte believes the state visit of Indian President Ram Nath Kovind in the country will further enhance the 70-year bilateral relations between India and the Philippines. Rosalie Kos explains why. President Rodrigo Duterte welcomed Indian President Ram Nath Kovind in the Malacanang Palace at past 3 this afternoon. President Kovind is in Manila for a five-day state visit. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the establishment of the Philippines-India bilateral relations. The two chief executives led the expanded bilateral meeting. They also witnessed the exchange of four agreements on maritime domain security, tourism, science and technology, and cultural exchange. Of the Philippines and the Indian Navy of the Republic of India. President Kuvin and I committed to further build a more dynamic and forward-looking relationship between the Philippines and India. A friendship that allows us to seize the tremendous opportunities of today that are of ours for the taking. And a partnership that enables us to face challenges to hard-won progress jointly and effectively. The Philippine chief executive stressed the importance of inclusive cooperation. The era of the zero games and the us versus them approach to world affairs is over. What we need now is open and inclusive cooperation based on mutual respect and sovereign equality. Indian President Kovind expressed his sympathies to the Philippines after a strong earthquake hit several parts of Mindanao. I convey my deepest condolences on the loss of life caused by the earthquake in Mindanao and wish a speedy recovery to those affected. The Duterte administration prepared a state banquet for Indian President Kovind. Tomorrow, the Indian chief executive will meet liver transplant patients as well as the beneficiaries of the Mahavir Philippines Foundation. He will also attend the Philippine-India Business Conclave and the Fort Asian India Business Summit. And during the last day of his state visit on Sunday, he will meet the Indian community in Taguig City. Indian President Kovin will depart for Tokyo, Japan on Monday morning for the enthronement ceremony. Meanwhile, Malacanang was asked by media about the rectangular device the president was wearing while welcoming the Indian president. The president has been wearing this since last Friday and according to President's spokesperson Salvador Panelo, it is an air purifier to protect the president from persons within his proximity who have coughs and colds. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacania. And those are the reasons behind the news this October 18, 2019. On behalf of Alex Balcazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo. And before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Lahat sila. Albayalde, Baloyo, the other people in the group, Lana Gradian, are guilty. I'm not saying guilty, 
of this malfeasance. Mali ang ginawa nila. Nang nagpunta po ako doon, binigbig. Ang unang ibinigay sa akin ay PD, 300,000. Ngayon, kasi ang sabi niya sa akin, 600,000 ang ibibigay niya sa akin. Kasi sabi niya, mas malaki ang mapupunta sa akin kaysa doon sa ibang mga witness. Ang sabi niya, pagbalik ko uh, sa sunod na hearing, automatic ibibigay niya yung another 300. Well... I think you are that's a very stupid paradigm because I can be evil like you and more than if I want to be. Kulod is badly hit now. And I place Espinito there. Yung tinatakutan nila na polis. Sabi ko, go there and you are free to kill everybody. The era of them zero games and the us versus them approach to world affairs is over. What we need now is open and inclusive cooperation based on mutual respect and sovereign equality.